Good morning, Pathways. It's uh, great to see you. Welcome to church. And uh, glad that you're here. I'm, I'm actually really, really excited about this uh, series uh, called Get in the Game. And uh, actually, I'm surprised that there was that kind of uh, reaction because last week, I'll tell you in a moment why I'm really excited about this series, but I'm surprised by your reaction because last week we showed that teaser video and you clapped for me. So I really thought that God was at work in this service. In fact, I told first service, I said second service, they're deeply in love with Jesus because they allowed even me, not just a sinner, but like a tax collector, a Bears fan, to be a part of what's happening here at Pathways. And now I get some grumbling taking place. Okay, all right, maybe, maybe we had some people from first service come to second service just to, uh, you know, anyways, they booed me in first service, so at least you didn't boo me. So I appreciate that. Hey, uh... Uh, just before we get too long in the service, I want to give you a heads up and let you know that as I was praying and internalizing my message, thinking this through, I thought this is an absolutely perfect message to give people an opportunity to accept Christ at the end of service. So I just want to kind of give you a warning at the end of service today, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you the chance to do that. And here's why. Let me explain it to you. Because throughout all the generations going back to the very beginning with Jesus when it comes to the gospel, there's been these moments in people's lives, and it goes across cultures, it goes across languages, across races and color. It doesn't matter. There's moments when people begin to really believe. There's moments when it's like, okay, I really think I believe this. Some, some questions get answered. God does something in a heart, and all of a sudden, they need a moment. We call it a conversion moment, a moment where they say, yes, I actually believe. So today could be that day, could be that moment for you. So I just want to give you a heads up and let you know that at the end of service today, I want to give you the chance to do that. All right, so we're in a series. Uh, we're going to start it today. Get in the game. Get in the game. And here's why I'm really excited about uh, this series, because I had a blast doing the teaser video up at Lambeau. It was amazing. In fact, when I went up there, I was walking through the pro shop with this t-shirt on, as you saw last weekend or on social media. And uh, one of the sales reps, she said to me, she said, who threw up on your t-shirt? I said, okay. I said, touche. So, and then uh, I was, um, I got an email from a, a guy at our church who, who works for the Packers, and he said, I was so greatly disappointed that our security team, uh, uh, the Packers at Lambeau, did not escort you off premises when you shot that video. And, uh, and then somebody actually, uh, one of our volunteers, a guy by the name of Terry, Terry puts together all the communion, communion elements every single time we do communion. That is like his serving role. In fact, can we give it up for Terry? Yeah. He does it by himself. We try to feed Terry volunteer help, but Terry's like, no, God has told me, he has asked me to do this. And so he does it every single time. He is so faithful. But you know what? He dissed me. He was throwing shade on me because here's what he said to me when he saw me backstage. Because I didn't wear this in the lobby or in the, in the parking lot. You saw that earlier today because I figured I didn't want to get shot. So I just, I, I wore this back here. I changed. And Terry saw me and said, where were you shopping? They actually sell that stuff up here? And I'm like, oh, okay, Terry, I see how it is. Um, so we might fire him from his uh, volunteer role. No, I'm just joking. Um, but yeah, we're, we're in this series, Get in the Game. And uh, I, I actually, I'm so excited about this series because I believe that God wants to speak to every single person over the next couple of weeks. And, and um, I want to talk a little bit today about, about who's, who's your coach. Now, I know when I was up there at Lambeau, I mean, you guys have such a storied tradition and history of great coaches, right? Whether it's Mike McCarthy or, or whether it's Mike Holmgren, you guys just have some great coaches. And, and so um, I, I was thinking about uh, the, the series titled, Get, Get in the Game. And, and the question that we have to ask ourselves, what game? What game are we talking about? We're talking about football game? No, we're not talking about football game. We're not talking about the money game. We're not even talking about the God game, although God's not a game, and God does have some implications in the game that we're talking about. Listen to me. Here's the game that we're discussing. The game is a game that you play every single day. It's called your life. Every single day. It's not a game that you have to get into. It's a game that you're already in. Every single day you wake up, it's called your life and you're in the game. Whether you want to be in the game and you want to hit the snooze button, whether you think, oh, it's a Monday, or whether you're trying to escape some pain, or you're thinking my past, or I don't want to go to work today, or school, oh, first week of school, I'm so done, one summer vacation. I mean, whatever, you're in the game. 
And there are no OTAs, there's no preseason. This is regular season with some huge implication that leads to those moments of playoff moments and then Super Bowl moments like who you're going to marry. Like, like, like what college are you going to go to? Like when can you retire? Like these big pivotal moments. Am I going to parent super well in this moment? These are huge moments. And the question, the question I want to ask you is this. The question is, are you winning? Are you winning in the game that you're already playing? Are you winning in your life? Are you winning in relationships? Are you winning as a new husband or new wife? Are you winning as, as, a, as a mom or or as a daughter or as a son, are you winning as a student? Are you winning when it comes to your business? Are you winning when it comes to the plan that, that, that you foresee when it comes to your work? Are you winning in your relationships? Are you winning in the area of your finance? Are you winning when it comes to your personal health? Are you exercising? Are you, are you eating health, are some healthy habits? Are you winning when it comes to your emotions? Like, are you experiencing joy and peace and happiness? Are there things in your life? Are you winning in life? Because I want you to win. I want, I want you to win. I, I, want, I want God to, to, to be winning in you and through you. And, and if you're here this weekend and you're not a Christian, this is a fantastic message, a fantastic series to be a part of because there are some really cool things that, that we're going to learn. And, and the big idea that I want every one of you to hear and, and, and pay attention to is simply this. If you're not dedicated to your disciplines, if you're not dedicated to your disciplines, you're going to be destroyed by your distractions. That's kind of the bottom line for this series. And, and when we talk uh, disciplines, I'm not talking necessarily about the, the, the disciplines that kind of triggers a thought or a, a word, an image in your mind. If you're a Christian, you might be thinking the discipline of reading the Bible. Or, or the discipline of, of tithing, or the discipline of church attendance. I'm not talking about those kinds of disciplines, although I believe in them, although I practice and try to embody those. Di- I'm talking about disciplines that are, have broader implications. They're people disciplines. Uh, did you know that your uh, most famous coach for the Green Bay Packers, uh, what was his name? His name was Vince most famous coach in 1961 in, in, in spring training, he gathered the team together and he gave us a famous speech. He held up a football and said, gentlemen, this is a football. Now, he wasn't talking to Pop Warner, little players, peewees. He was talking to like professionals, paid athletes. Why? Because he wanted to make sure the fundamentals, the disciplines were in place in order for them to be champions. And he said, listen, this is the size of the football. This is out of bounds. And they were like, what are we talking about? And he said, man, we're going to win and we're going to be committed to excellence. We're going to win at this game. We're going to win at life. In fact, Lombardi was really big in saying that it is faith, family, and then football. Your coach set priority in terms of what life should look like in order to win, and how many of us get that order mixed up? And we root for the same team that he led to championships, and he said this is the order of priority. Because when we start talking about winning, there's only one person that sets the agenda and keeps the score, and his name is God. It's not the world around us, it's not culture, it's not our own ambitions, our own ego, our own pride. It's God himself and some pretty good wisdom from Vince Lombardi. He says, uh, this is what it is about, the fundamentals. And so the bottom line for this series is if you're not dedicated to your disciplines, you're going to be destroyed by your distractions. And we have a lot of distractions, don't we? We have a ton of distractions. Now, uh, the discipline that I want to discuss today as we look at this idea of coaching and who's your coach, I want to talk about the discipline of making decisions, making decisions. We all make decisions. In in fact, your life is the sum total of of the number of decisions that you have made. Every single day you make decisions. Think about if you're a student and you woke up on Tuesday, if you went back to school and you made this decision, what am I going to wear? In fact, you probably picked it out and had it all ready to go. And then by Friday, you're waking up late thinking to myself, oh my, I gotta gotta get something to wear, right? We all make decisions. What am I gonna eat? Who, I mean, there are so many decisions that we make in life. And today, I wanna talk about decision making because life, life, life is about making decisions. Life is about, your life is about the decisions that you have made or decisions that are made about you. And even the decisions that are made about you, you have the power to make decisions about the decisions that have been made about you, don't you? Think about it this way. The decisions that were made about you, how how are you going to respond to those decisions? How much power are you going to give the decisions that have been made about you? Are you going to play the victim? 
Are you going to play the blamer? What, how much power and credence about the decisions that were made about you are you going to give in your life? Are you going to allow them to replay and to shape your identity? You even have the power to make decisions about the decisions that have been made about you. Life is about making decisions. It's all about making decisions. In fact, uh, decisions are so powerful. Don't you ever wish that sometimes you could go back and undecide some things? I wish you could undecide the decision I made to marry my first spouse. I wish I could undecide saying those words to my kids. I wish I could undecide that financial error. I got way too cocky, and I, I blew it in the area of, of this financial decision. We wish we could go and undecide. Don't you wish you could undecide? Man, I wish I would have never picked up a cigarette. Because now I smoke and it's just killing my, and I wish I would have never made that decision. We all have decisions that we wish we could undecide. They're called regrets. We have those in our lives. And so, um, okay, I'm kind of done holding this ball. Can I throw this now? I'm going to throw this to my friend. Ready? All right, good. He's a Packers fan. See, he caught that. Bears fan would have dropped it. Anyways, uh, all right. So here's the thing. What I want to do today, and if you're not a Christian, it's a great message to sit in on, because here's the deal. We as Christ followers, we have the privilege, and, and here's what we're called to do. We're called to, to, to invite God into our lives as we make decisions, as we make decisions. And uh, uh, what I want to talk about is if you are a believer, we pray this prayer sometimes, I pray this. Here's how the prayer goes. God, here's, here's, here's how we involve God. We, we, we use these words. God, show me your will for my life. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Show me your will for my family. Show me your will for, for I pray this prayer for you. Show me your will for, for pathway. Show me your will for this next season. God, show me your will for how I should parent. Show me your will. We pray this. Show me your will. Show me your will. Show me your will. Because we want to make great decisions. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian today, you might not be praying that prayer, but I dare you to pray that prayer. Because I believe, I'm convinced, and my experience is when we pray that prayer that God wants to speak to you. He wants to lead you and to guide you. And I, and I understand that the will of God, if you're a Christian, you've been doing this for a while, you've been following Jesus, the will of God is complicated, it's complex, I get it. It's a little scary. I mean, after all, I mean, uh, Moses, he, he prayed for God's will and, and God appeared to him in a burning bush. He, he, if you think about Saul, Saul was thrown from his donkey, right? And, and Jesus showed up and said, uh, uh, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Jesus said, I, I want to use you as my special instrument to spread my message to, to, to all the Gentile world. And Saul became Paul. Or, or what about Jonah? He took a little fish, right? A little fish story. He got swallowed by a fish when the will of God kind of went off and he, he chose his own path. God was so committed. He wanted to show Jonah. So this idea of the will of God, this can be scary. It's a little complicated. It takes faith. But when we look at the will of God, we pray, show me the will of God. God, show me your will. Show me your will for my family. Show me your will. God, when we pray that simple prayer, and if you don't believe in God, I dare you to pray that prayer because what could hurt? All you're going to do is say words in the air, but I believe they're not words in the air. They're words to the Father's heart, our Heavenly Father. Could be your Heavenly Father. Because God loves you so much. And when we talk about the will of God, there is one verse that I want you to uh, get in your head. In fact, I didn't have time to uh, put it on my slide support. I, I read it last night. I was kind of praying through and thinking about my message. And I, I read this verse. I want to give it to you. So if you're taking notes or you have a phone, write this in your phone. It's called Psalm 32.8. I don't have it to memory yet, but here's how it goes. I'll give you a little paraphrase. I will instruct you and lead you in the way you should go. That's what God says. I will instruct you and lead you in the way you should go. Uh, I will counsel you with my, here's key word, loving eye. Isn't that awesome? That the heavenly father has his loving eye on you. That he wants to instruct you and lead you in the way you should go. That our Heavenly Father cares about your life and my life so much that he wants to counsel you in the way you should go with his loving eye. Not his judgmental eye, not his condemning eye, not some eye. That, his loving eye in your life. Now, when we talk about the will of God, if we were to look at Scripture and you were to categorize the will of God, you could put it in three buckets. 
Here are the three buckets when we talk about God's will. In decision making, here are three buckets. It's the sovereign will of God, it's the moral will of God, and it's the personal will of God. Question, which one are we most interested in? Talk to me. Okay, you, you know, we can be selfish. Here's what we are most interested in, the personal will, right? God, what do you have for my life? <laughs> God, I need, show me, you, for, for me, right? It, it's okay. This is what we're most interested in. We're probably the most ignorant about the sovereign will of God, and we're most threatened by the moral will of God. So let me kind of break these down. Here's what I want you to see, though. The, 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 the clearer we are about the first two, the easier it is to discern the last one. So let me break these down, just kind of pull them apart. First, the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God is that God can do anything that God wants to do because he is God. God is God, you're not, and so God can do whatever. He doesn't need to be fair. He doesn't need to match your agenda. He is God, and he can do anything. He is like, uh, how many of you are dads, you're a father, and you know when your kids are saying, hey, can we watch this? Can we watch this? And, and all of a sudden, you take the remote, and you just change the channel. Why? Because you're dad, <laughs> and you pay the bills, and it's your TV. It's like God and his sovereign will, he's just going to do what God's going to do. And there ain't nothing that nobody can do about it. That's probably a wrong grammatical sentence, but, right? Let me give you a verse. Psalm 115 verse 3 says this. says, our God is in heaven. He does, say that, whatever pleases him. He does whatever pleases him. It was just God's will because he had the remote and he could say, you know what? I'm going to choose Abraham. And out of Abraham, I'm going to choose a special group of people, the nation of Israel. He didn't choose another nation. He didn't choose another group. He chose Israel. Why? Because it pleased him. And then through the nation, he said hundreds and hundreds of times, he said, I'm going to bring about a Messiah whose name was Jesus. And Jesus came to planet earth and he died on the cross and he was raised to life. And here's where it applies to all of us. And God's sovereign will, because he's God, because he could just say, this is the channel I want to watch. He said, you know what? I'm going to raise up a group of people called my church, and my son Jesus, he's going to start a movement called my church. And Jesus said, he took 100 people, 120 people, right before he ascended into heaven, he said, you know what? I just want to let you know you're going to change the world. They were like, what? What? Yeah, you're going to change the world. I want you to go from here in Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to like all the way around the world. And I want, to, I want you to share the life-changing message of who I am, the gospel. And they're like, okay. We're a little nervous to go back to Jerusalem because didn't they kill you in Jerusalem? If we go back there, they might kill us. And so he kept saying, no, but you can do it. And, and I'm going to send my spirit and put him in your hearts. And you're going to have so much power. And, and you're just going to go out. And they're like, a little golf clap. They're like, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. And yet, that's exactly what happened. Why? Because you can't stop God's sovereign will. You can't stop it. Pharaoh tried to stop it. He tried to stop the, 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 the Israelites from leaving, leading Egypt. And what happened? God just said, we're, we're going to, we're, I'm, we're, my people, I'm telling you, they're going to be let go, Pharaoh. Throughout human history, people try to stop God's will. They try to stand in the way of what God wants to do in his church. I mean, all the time, and God just says, this is unstoppable. That's why Jesus said this. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I wish I could get this in your hearts and heads, and I know I understand that all of you are busy, and all of you have families to raise, and houses to keep up, and mortgages, and bills, and you're thinking, and your life is frantic and hectic. I get it. But here's what I want you to hear, that when you participate in Jesus' church, when you participate in a local church like Pathways, when you give and serve and you invite people, when you're involved in the life of the church, you're involved in the sovereign will of God. You're joining God in building the only thing that God has promised to build here on planet Earth, and that's the church. Do you realize that perhaps, maybe, in my humble opinion, that the greatest thing that we can do as Christians is to protect the integrity of the church and hand it off to the next generation as the most transformative entity on earth because it lifts up the name of Jesus, the only one that can change and mend a broken human heart. So maybe we need to think about our priorities. Maybe we need to think about what winning looks like when it comes to our lives because we can get so distracted. And if you're distracted, you can get destroyed by your distractions. But 
if you pay attention to those disciplines, man, good things can take place. So uh, that's the uh, sovereign will of God, the moral will of God. Moral will of God is simply this, what God has already said. It's the do's and don'ts of Scripture. God wants you to tell the truth. God wants you to pay your taxes. God, uh, God wants you to uh, forgive. He wants you to forgive people. Do you know forgiveness is a miracle? You can't do it in your own strength. God has to do it through you. If you've ever forgiven somebody, you know that that's a, that's a God thing. That's just, but God wants you to forgive. It's, it's part of his uh, moral will. Let, let, me, uh, let me give you a verse. We just got done with... Um, a series called uh, How to Neighbor. Let me give you a verse out of Luke 10, 27. It says this. It says, love, say that word with me, love, not like your neighbor, not tolerate them. If you're a Christian, you're called to, this is a moral will. This is something God wants you to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. When it comes to the, the, the sexual integrity and ethics of Christians, this is God's will for your life. I already know it. I can give it to you. He wrote it like 2,000 years ago. It's called 1 Thessalonians. It's a little book in the New Testament at the end. 1 Thessalonians, this is what Paul says to a church. He says this, and this is what he says to you and me. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. It is, say those two words with me, God's, the moral will of God. We cringe and we try to duck these things because these are uncomfortable. And I'm telling you, this is where life transformation, when you become obedient to God's word that he's already shared with you, his moral law, good things happen in your life. I always tell my girls, if you make good decisions, good things happen. You make bad decisions, bad things happen. Right? It is God's will that you should be sanctified, word for set apart. We talked about it earlier in service. Word for becoming more like Jesus, holy. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That God designed sex to be expressed in a one-man, one-woman, lifelong relationship. Anything outside of that is sexual immorality. Anything outside of that hurts God's heart and reaps some poor consequences in your life. What are those things outside of it? I know sometimes we get touched up on, on things that are like, we get really hot on a couple. It's anything outside of that. It's lust. It's adultery. It's, it's, it's pornography, it's anything, it's, it's homosexuality, it's, it's, you don't have to pray to God, God, should I move in with this person prior to me getting married and sleep with them? No! You don't have to pray on that. Why? Because I have a really good prayer life with God. Well, he's not going to go against what he's already said in his word because it's already a part of his moral will. Right? Now, personal will of God is the one that we're most interested in. We're going to talk about that in a second. L let me give you a couple more verses on uh, moral will of God. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, what about Exodus? I know parents, sometimes you tell your kids this. Kids, listen to this. It is in the Bible. Honor your father and your mother. I see parents right now going like this to their students. They're waking them up. See, see, I told you it's in the Bible. I just couldn't find the chapter and verse. I got it now, right? Parents, you could take pictures of that right there. That's a good one for you, okay? All right, there it is. It's just part of his will. Like, he, he's already put that in there. All right, so the personal will of God. Let, let's look at the three wills again of, of God. One, the sovereign will of God. He's going to do what he wants to do. Ain't nobody, it's unstoppable. The moral will of God. It's the do's and don'ts already written. And then the personal will of God. I said this earlier, but let me toss it on the screen for you. The clearer you are about God's sovereign and moral will, the easier it is to discern God's personal will in your life. It's the context of which you begin to understand God's personal will for you. That's why it is important if you're a parent of a, of a child or a teenager that they're a part of the ministry here at Pathways. You've got to bring them to Kids Church. You've got to bring them on Wednesday nights at 630 to our student ministry. You know why? Because they need to understand what God is up to in the world. And they need to understand the stories of the Bible. Did you know that in a calendar year, 52 weeks, the, your children are going to learn 50 Bible stories? They need to know the do's and don'ts and what, that's the foundation by which they begin to understand then who they should marry or what college they should go to. This is the reason that you need to be at church. This is the reason that you need to come to the row. You don't know how many times I meet people and they're talking to me and say, hey, I wonder, I have a question about this. And I'm thinking, you're wasting your time. God's already said that, that it's already there. It's already contained. 
And, and some of us struggle, and I get it. The Bible's a big book, and, and understanding the stories of the Bible. Let me just pastor you in this moment and say this to you. If you have a hard time understanding the book, because some of us, we, we wake up one day, and you're like, uh, you know, we usually do it like on January 1st. I'm going to read the Bible all the way through. Have you ever done that? And then you get to Leviticus, and you're like, oh, my word, really? Oof. But you can't say anything because you feel guilty because you know it's the Bible, but you're like, man, how's Leviticus show me your will for my life? Leviticus is killing me, God. Right? L let me tell you something. If you have a hard time understanding the Bible, uh, I had one of my friends in Bible college, he did this. He, uh, he actually bought a children's Bible. I said to him, why do you do that? And he said, because I never want to forget the stories of the Bible. So go get yourself just a children's Bible, like a real basic one. Get them with the pictures. It's awesome. And just read the children's Bible to understand the story of God and how that can impact your life. I promise you, it's going to help with some of those foundational things. If you're a little further along advanced and you want to read the Bible in depth, there's a book that I would uh, just uh, uh, reference. It's called Reading the Bible for All It's Worth. It's by Gordon Fee and uh, Douglas Stewart. Reading the Bible for All It's Worth. It's a fantastic guide in helping you to understand the Bible. All right, so... Um, uh, the clearer you are about God's sovereign and moral will, the easier it is to discern God's personal will for your life. And let me give you the application. The, the, the application, the most important application around this idea is uh, simply this. It's that Jesus Christ came to earth as fully God and fully human. In understanding God's personal will, because that's what we're, we're most interested, we're interested, we're selfish as human beings. We want to understand what God has for us. L let me give you the application. To understand Jesus and to fall in love with Jesus and to follow Jesus is the best way for you and me to understand the Father's will. Not just what he's up to in the world, not what he's just already said in the do's and don'ts and the life transformation, the benefits that occur from that, but the personal will of God for your life, which I believe he is so concerned about your life in order to glorify him. He's not into building your bank account. He's not into your agenda. He's into building the church, his church. He wants to use you in that grand endeavor to share a life-changing message with as many people as possible. But here's, here it is. Here's the application that Jesus came to this earth as fully God and fully human. In fact, if you're familiar with the New Testament, you know the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 1 is highly theological. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everybody gets, you know, there's commentators that talk about what's the Word we're going to kind of look at that in just a second. Verse 14, it says this of John chapter 1. It says, the word. What's the word? The word. When we say a word, a word or a series of word, words express our hearts and our thoughts, right? Our hearts and our, and our thoughts. Jesus is the expression of God's heart, of the Father's heart, and his thoughts. It's a word. He embodies not just words, but he's actually the word. He's God himself. He's a message. He's a living message of what God has designed sovereignly, what he has designed morally, and what he wants for your life. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only son. Second half of that verse said, who came from the father, full of he didn't come from the Father part way, half of this. He's going to bring a couple things, you know, maybe no, no, no. What did he come full of? Full of grace and truth. If there's one thing I want you to hear today, when Jesus Christ came to earth, he came full of grace. He came with a message to say that he loves you, that he created you and designed you, that he knows you, that he is so intimately acquainted with all of your thoughts, and he still loves you. Even when you get mad, even when you want to give up, even when, when it looks like it is impossible, God loves you through his son, Jesus Christ, and he has come to give you grace. But when Jesus came, he also came full of truth. Because the father realized that, you know what, you can come and you can say grace, 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 and you can say grace, 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 but unless there's truth there, it doesn't have the kind of transformation that is needed in our lives. And so Jesus came full of truth to say, this is the path, here's my loving eye, here's how I want to instruct you, here's how I want to lead you, here's how I want to guide you. question is, would you listen to him? Could he be your coach? 
Would you pay attention to him? You know, when uh, great quarterbacks, I, I know you guys love, uh, uh, what's his name, number 12, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, good quarterback. I know, he's great. He does good. But, but I, I got to tell you, I've been a lifelong Bears fan. I started liking them when I was about seven, eight years old in 1985, Super Bowl shuffle. You know that deal? I just, I, lo- I fell in love with the Bears. I've always loved them. But there's only really been one player from the Green Bay Packers that has caught my imagination when I was a kid. Actually, I was a teenager. His name was number four, Brett Favre. Oh, I love Brett Favre. I love his passion. I love the way he played. I love the way he would jump around. He was a flawed individual. He had a lot of, a lot of failures and mistakes, and he made personal errors, but he was real. He was a human being, wasn't he? And the way he would jump around, and he would just, he was so, I just love the way he played. He didn't care about his body. He would just play. Every single day, it's like you and I are like a quarterback. We're like a a Brett Favre, and we run out into this world, and it's like this loud, noisy stadium, everybody vying for our attention and saying message to us. But if you ever watch Brett Favre or any great elite quarterback, when they walk out into the field and their fans screaming, either way, cheering or booing or whatever it is, eventually, here's what the quarterback will do. He'll go like this. Put his hands over his helmet. You know why? Because he wants to listen to the voice of who? Not the fans, the coach. Do you realize that God doesn't want you to listen to your fans, whether they hate you or whether whether whatever? He wants you to hear the voice of the Father. Would you go like this? Because the fans, their approval is up and down. Approval ratings go up and down. Do you realize that you're not living for the stadium and the fans in the stadium? You're living for the Father. Do you know the old school term? You're living for an audience of one. It's true. Because when you make decisions, there might be this person here and this person here and this person, and your spouse and your kids and all your boss and all these people around you kind of clamoring for your attention. But at the end of the day, if you're a serious-minded Christ follower, you have to say, thank you for that input. Thank you. Thank you. I can learn from that. I love that. Father, now what do you want me to do? You have to go like this. Because when you're locked into knowing what the Father wants you to do, it, ain't, it doesn't really matter what everybody else thinks. And you don't got to be a jerk to them. But at the end of the day, you have to have the confidence to know, God spoke to my heart. This is his will for my life. He has shown me his will. I'm going to do it. Verse 18. That's how it plays out. No one has ever seen God, but the one and the only Son who himself is God and is in closest relationship with the Father. Why would you not want to have Jesus as your coach and your Lord and Savior? He's in closest relationship with the Father. He knows the Father's voice. And he has made the Father known to all of us, to you. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. To transfer your trust from whatever you've been trusting in to to trust in Jesus Not only as your Savior, but as your coach. Now, how does he coach us? You know how he coaches us? When we position our hearts in front of him, something we call the chair, chair time. Chair time is so important. In fact, if you don't regularly, it's the most important appointment you can have every single day is to spend time with the Father. In fact, if you don't do this, you, you, you need to spend time. You need to open the Bible and you need to read a passage of Scripture in order to help you. Here's what I want every one of you. If you've never used uh, Uversion, the Bible app, if you don't know how to download an app, talk to somebody who, you know, in our church. We'll help you out. Call the church. I want you to do this. There is a, an app called Uversion. The Bible. It looks like the Bible. Download it on your tablet, your smartphone. And here, you can download a plan. It's written by Priscilla Shirer. She is powerful. In fact, the first day of this devotional thought is so awesome. I read it yesterday, and I thought, oh, this is so perfect. For the next six or seven days, there's a plan that you can do. Do it along with us. It's called discerning the voice of God. When we pray that prayer, show me your will, show me your will, how do you discern that? Priscilla is going to help you think through that from a biblical perspective. You need to download that, sit in your chair, position your heart, because God wants to speak to you, and he cares about every part of your life. I want to close with this story. Last week... Uh, Saturday night, I, I fell asleep. I was hanging out with some friends Saturday night, and we were joking. I said, oh, man, I'm going to come to service, and I won't be all there, and, you know, something, you know, whatever. And I, and I fell asleep uh, last Saturday night. I woke up at 4 in the morning, and I had fallen asleep with my contacts in my eyes. How many of you wear contacts? Any of you wear contacts? I have terrible eyes. In fact, if you wear contacts, you know some of the prescription. It's like, you know, minus 3 or minus 4 or whatever. My prescription is minus 11. 
in both eyes. So basically, my alarm clock is like the side of my wall, so I can see it in the morning. Like, I'm blind. So I woke up Sunday morning, and I, uh, I was rooting around in the drawer, and, and Laura's like, I was like, oh, man, no. And Laura's like, what, what, what's the problem? And I said, I only have one contact. Not a set, one. So I put one in my right eye, and I didn't have one in my left eye. Thank God. And I say that with all sincerity. Thank God I didn't have to speak last weekend. Bob Lenz was up. So I could, I could just walk in. I did the announcements. I did, but I was, I mean, I, you know, just, it was, it was hard. And uh, the next day, Monday is Labor Day, of course, and with my small group, we typically, we have this little tradition we started. The dads go out with their kids, and they go golfing. It's the day before school. And I thought to myself, God, I don't want to go golfing, and I can't see. I only have one contact. And by the way, I don't have any glasses because they're like Coke bottles, and I'm not wearing them in public. I'm too vain for that, so I broke those a long time ago. No, they're in my, but I just, I'm not wearing them. So I'm like, God, what am I going to do? Am I going to go out with an eye patch, look like a pirate on the golf course? I mean, what, what's going to happen? God, will you help me? And so I was driving away uh, from church, and I just felt like I, I just had this thought that came across my mind. Go to Shopco. Go to Shopco. I'm like, go to Shopco. Go to Shopco. I thought, well, maybe I could talk to somebody there. Maybe, you know, contacts or something. I thought, they're not going to give me contacts. I don't have, I've never had a, an exam there. They're going to want, you know. You know, any more to get something, it becomes so complicated, right? There's so much red tape. It's not like back in the day, you go, hey, oh yeah, oh, yeah, let's look out here. Let me help you out. It's like, it's all one big thing. It's like they have to do a you know, cotton swab to see if you're the real Adam Demetrician or not, okay? So I'm like, they don't know me. What are they going to do? I almost talked myself out of it, but I went to Shopco anyways. Walked into Shopco. I saw uh, some people, actually, I saw some people from 1045 Stairs. Pastor, I love that teaser video. I thought, man, God is at work at the 1045 service. They still accept me, love me as a bear fan. And then I saw some people from our small group. They were there, and I gave them a high five, and they were like, oh, yeah, I can't wait for this series. And I just felt like, and if you're not a religious person, if you don't know God, this might seem weird, but I felt like it was a place of peace in that moment. I felt like there was peace there. So I turned the corner, and I went into the optical place, and there was a person, a volunteer at Pathways. Her name is Karen. She was there, and she was like, hey, Pastor Adam, how are you doing? Why are you here? And I said, you're never going to believe it. I didn't have a contact in this morning. I don't have my contact. She said, oh. She said, really? She was like, well, what's your prescription? I'm like, negative 11. And I had the little box, and she's like, ooh. Said, um, said, good thing you didn't have to preach today. I said, yeah, good thing. Praise God. So she said, well, let me go look. And sure enough, she gave me a couple contacts. Just happen to have negative 11. Don't usually carry those. I said, here, take three of these. These should last you. Because I'd already called 1-800-CONTACTS, and I was already thinking, you know. And I walked away. I would have never, I'm convinced, I would have never been obedient to that thought that came across in my mind. It wasn't my thought. God gave me that thought. If I hadn't positioned my heart and consistently opening my life up to God, God, would you speak to me? God, would you show me your will? Spending time in the chair. Who's your coach? Who are you listening to? Are you making time for this? Making time for this? There's always going to be voices, friends. But this voice is the voice that counts. Would you bow your heads all across this room? In this moment, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you want him to rescue, say, I I need to establish a right relationship with you. I I need to trust you. I need to put my life in you, Jesus, because I'm I'm leading it right now. It's not going well. The greatest decision that you can make when it comes to making decision is the decision of who's in charge. And if you're in charge, it's not going to work out. It might for a year or a decade or a season, but eventually you're going to hit a wall And you're not going to win at life. You're going to start losing. And trust me, friends, it's going to be painful. It's going to be ugly. Don't wait for that wall. Make a decision. Listen to the coach. Maybe you've never prayed this prayer or you haven't prayed this prayer in a long time, but you want to surrender your life. 
to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You want him to begin not just to save you, but to coach you through this life so that you can use your life to glorify him. If that's you today, if you want to make that decision, if the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and you realize, like, I, this, is, this is my day, this is my moment. If you've never done this, if you haven't done it in a long time, can you just slip your hand up? Just raise your hand. Yep, yep, yep. See that? Yep, see that in the back? Yep. Okay. Now, if you feel comfortable, if you are a believer, there's about four or five people that raise their hands. If you would be willing to say this prayer along with them out loud, because I don't want to embarrass them. And yet I want them to say this prayer out loud because I feel like there's something powerful when we say something out loud audibly. You can say it quietly, but out loud. If you're not a believer and you chose not to make that decision, then you don't have to say this, obviously. But there are hundreds of people around here who have said this, had this moment. And so we want to share in this with you. So if you are a Christian or if you raised your hand, let's say this prayer together. God, you know my life. You created me. So why wouldn't I allow you to coach me? Today, I want you to be my coach. I want you to be my savior. Forgive me of my sin. I confess them to you. Erase them. Forgive me. Come into my life. Change my life. I want to live for you. I pray, that, I pray this prayer in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, you made the greatest decision of your life. And now you're inviting Jesus to change you. And now he's going to come with his full wisdom, full of grace and truth to guide your life. I promise you that. In fact, uh, can we just... Show some, some love and celebration for God in changing some people here today. Yeah.